get started. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ali Jacobay, I'm the Associate Director of IDSS, and it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome our distinguished speaker for today's seminar, uh, Professor Nick Christakis from Yale. Um, uh, many of you know of uh, uh, Nick's uh, work, uh, I'm sure. Uh, he's had a distinguished career across multiple institutions. Um, and some of his work actually very much relates to the kind of efforts that we want to have uh, within IDSS. Uh, he has a very distinguished uh, CV. I'm not going to go over everything. I'll just point out a few things. He's a, a medical doctor, a board certified internist and has a PhD in sociology and has a degree in uh, public health, uh, is a co-director of the Yale Institute for Network Science, and uh, has been uh, actively doing research in uh, a lot of interesting areas of the interface of statistics, networks, contagion, and uh, public health. It's a, he's a, also I should say this, uh, he's a, a uh, member of many uh, academies has won uh, uh, a long list of awards, but I'd like to give him more time to, uh, to uh, give us uh, uh, his presentation rather than going over his seat. So thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that really nice introduction. And uh, I've had a really warm welcome today. I've met with, I think, some of you, many of you, not many of you, but some of you, and uh, many of you, but you are a small set of the subset of, the, of those assembled here, uh, and had a really good day so far. And I will be sticking around afterwards for a reception if there's some questions or things people want to talk about. So, so humans are embedded in social networks. And these networks obey very particular uh, biological, psychological, sociological, and mathematical rules and principles. And taking this into account, gives us new opportunities to intervene in human social systems in whole new ways. We gain new insights into our behaviors and new ways to change them. And in fact, we can use an understanding of social network structure and function for good, to intervene in online and offline interactions, to, advance, to enhance our health, our wealth, our security, and our civic life. And in fact, in the broadest sense, taking our embeddedness within networks seriously shifts the focus of our gaze to the externalities of our interventions, engaging us in the study of the response to treatment, not just among the treated, but among the untreated. What I'm interested in is when we do something to a person or we do something to a population, what happens not to the people to whom we target the intervention, rather what happens to everyone else around that person. And I'll show you a number of examples uh, today. So I'm interested in real social networks, the kind we humans have been making for tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of years, and not just the recent online variety. And this is what real networks look like. Every dot is a person. Every line between the dots represents some sort of relationship between the two people, who's whose friend, who's whose spouse or sibling or coworker or neighbor, for example. This is an unweighted, undirected graph. That means all the ties just uh, exist or not. They're dichotomous. You could, in principle, imagine more complex ways of rendering the graph. But even this is quite complex already. And to my eye, these networks are intricate things of beauty. And they are so elaborate and so complex and so ubiquitous, in fact, that one has to wonder, what purpose do they serve? I mean, why are we embedded in networks? Why do we humans do this? Why do each of us choose our friends, inherit our relatives? All the people around us are doing the same thing. And we make this human equivalent of an ant colony. And we proceed to live out our lives within a particular location within this social graph. So why are we embedded in these networks? How do they form? How do they work? And how do they affect us? And I've spent the last 15 or so years researching how and why human beings form social networks and how they affect our, our lives in many ways, our health, our desires, our feelings, our thoughts, and our actions. Now, part of this work has involved, and I've had some very interesting conversations with people this morning. I didn't realize how much this was also of interest to people here at, at, uh, at MIT in different parts of MIT. Part of this work has involved exploring the evolutionary basis of social network structure and function. Now, social networks afford people within them different possible structural locations. These are very simple ideas. Probably most, many of you know this already, but let me just summarize a couple of basic ideas. If you look at this network, people have different, um, 
people have different positions within this graph. So for instance, node B has four connections and node D has six connections. This is known as the degree of a node. People know this about themselves. They know how many friends they have. Uh, you have 10 friends. You have eight friends. I have no friends. People know this about themselves. But there are also higher order properties of, of network position, of your position within the graph, which you might not know about yourself. For example, node C has six connections, and so does node D. And, and that might be the limit of their understanding of the position within the network. But we, with this bird's eye view, can see that C and D are very different. Uh, and I can cultivate that intuition by asking you, who would you rather be if a deadly germ was spreading through the network? But D. You should have the intuition that D is going to be less likely to get whatever's spreading and less likely to get it early in the course of the epidemic. Now, who would you rather be if a juicy piece of gossip were spreading through the network? C. You have the same into that the opposite, that C is going to be more likely to get it. And this is known as the centrality of a node, and it can be quantified in a variety of ways with eigenvector centrality, which of course is like Google PageRank centrality, um, Google PageRank, or, or a betweenness centrality and other metrics. And finally, there's the difference between A and B. B has four connections, and so does A. But the difference between the two is that the friend of a friend of B's is not a friend of B's, whereas for A, the friend of a friend of A's is a friend of A's, is back again a friend of A's. And this is known as the transitivity of a node, or the probability that your friends are friends with each other. So we did early on a rather uh, sort of straightforward twin study of, this, uh, of this, uh, these properties. And uh, here on the y-axis, we showed the percent of the variance explained, or the heritability. And here are the three traits we just reviewed. And we found that 46% of the variation in how many friends you have can be explained by your genes. Now, that's not a very surprising result. Now that just says people vary. Some people are born shy. Some people are born gregarious. But we also found that the higher order properties can also be partially explained by your genes. So specifically, 47% of your variation in your transitivity can be explained by your genes. And this is a very bizarre result. Because what I've just told you is that if you have Tom, Dick, and Harry in a room, whether Dick is friends with Harry depends not just on Dick's genes or on Harry's genes, but on Tom's genes. Whether you two guys are friends with each other depends on his genes. How can that be? Well, we think the reason is that people vary in their tendency to introduce their friends to each other. Some people knit the networks around them together, and some people do not introduce their friends to each other. And finally, even 29% of the variation in how central you are can also be explained by your genes. So the fundamental reality of our desire for connection and our susceptibility to influence, it turns out, has always been with us. And where you are in this vast fabric of humanity depends in part on your genes. And my lab has been amassing evidence that it is indeed not a coincidence that we form networks with particular properties. We've shown that there's an evolutionary significance to and heritability of social network structure and function, and that phenomena like peer influence and homophily, or the fact that we prefer to uh, connect with people we resemble, um, have uh, fundamental significance. Some of our more recent work has looked at the, the issue of like at first sight. Why do people preferentially attach to other people as friends, which we think is analogous to love at first sight and may also have a, a, an ancient uh, origin? Anyway, overall, we believe across evolutionary time, it seems that the benefits of a connected life outweigh the costs in our species. Now, if it's the case, that uh, network structure has an ancient you know, genetic antecedents and significance, it begs the question of how ancient this structure is. So what we ideally would have loved to have done is to sort of fly back 10,000 years ago and map the social networks of a population you know, in, in very ancient times. Now, of course, we couldn't do that. So we instead hit upon the idea of mapping the social networks of a population that lives like we did uh, during the Pleistocene, specifically the Hadza hunter-gatherers of Tanzania. Uh, there are only about 1,000 of them left. They, they sleep out under the stars. They have no material possessions to speak of. They hunt and they gather for their food. Um, and what we decided to do was, was to, and they live around Lake Ayasi in Tanzania. And what we decided to do was to create a photographic census of all living adult Hadza, a kind of Hadza Facebook. And we printed this on posters. And my, my postdoc, Corinne Epicella, uh, went into the field. And this was actually very difficult work because you, you can't schedule an appointment with a Hadza person. You, you just sort of have to sit there and wait. And like a week later, literally a week later, someone will walk by and you'll say, excuse me, who are your friends? 
and you ask them to point to the picture in various ways, and then, then you wait another week for someone else to walk by, and then maybe you relocate somewhere else and wait a week, and it's very painstaking to do this, but, but we did. And, um, and, when we, and we asked them who their friends were in a variety of ways, and when we did that, what we found was that the Hadza networks, mathematically and visually, look just like modernized networks. So despite the fact that in the intervening 10,000 years, we've invented agriculture, we've invented cities, we've invented telecommunications, the structure, the deep structure of our networks is the same uh, as it was, let's say, uh, back then. So network structure seems to have an ancient origin consistent with our work on its partially um, genetic basis. Now in a parallel stream of work leading up to about five years ago, using both observational and experimental methods, we and others have, were able to provide evidence that a variety of behaviors and phenomena beyond germs spread within networks via processes of social contagion and that they did so beyond uh, dyadic connections. So what's interesting about this work is not that I might infect Dean, but could we find evidence that my impact on Dean then has an impact on you? Yeah? The previous slide when you stated that uh, networks in the past uh, network in Pasta community was similar to network we have right now. Yeah. What do you mean by similar? Well, I didn't show you that, but um, we looked at all of these mathematical properties, the degree distribution, the transitivity, the existence of reciprocity, the existence of something known as degree assortativity, clique formation, uh, fingerprinting, that is to say, the s tiny subgraphs, the, f the uh, frequency of little um, motifs within the network were the same. And we compared it to a variety of other networks from the United States and other parts of the world. And since then, we've done other work mapping networks in, in, this, in Sudan, in, uh, in Honduras, in, uh, in Uganda, in India. And we, we keep observing the same properties. I, I have a whole talk on the genetics and evolutionary biology of networks. And, and in that talk, I also uh, I raise a, a number of questions about why these networks have the properties that they do. Uh, maybe at the end, I can give you some more of that if you're still interested. But also visually, you should be able to see that. You know, imagine the limiting, the boundary conditions are, uh, if you had, there are about, I think, 100 or 200 people on this graph. I can't remember right now, maybe 100. The boundary conditions would be fully connected, so fully saturated graph. And at the other condition, it would be completely disconnected. No one's connected to anyone else. And in between, you can have you know, an untold number of possible ways of graphing uh, the network, of creating a network. But only a certain subset is ever seen in human beings. For instance, you never find a regular lattice. If you go out and map a human network, it doesn't look like a regular lattice. Well, why not? Why don't we see that? Anyway, there's a whole set of ideas there. Did I answer your question even briefly? Yeah? I kind of moved beyond it because I have other agenda today. Um, so anyway, so in a parallel stream of work, um, using a variety of observational and experimental methods, we found that a variety of behaviors can spread. And the important thing is here that they spread beyond dyads. So we did some work on obesity, smoking, drinking, and drug use behavior, some work on emotional states like happiness, loneliness, depression, and also we started a program of work, some of which I'll come to in a bit, on altruistic behavior. Others have looked at things like crime and voting. My colleague James Fowler did an enormous RCT using Facebook data, 61 million people randomly assigned, was able to show voting cascades within the graph, purchasing behavior, and ideas. So people's attitudes, decisions, and behaviors depend in quantifiable ways on the attitudes, decisions, and behaviors of others to who they are directly and also indirectly uh, connected. And in fact, a key idea about networks is that networks magnify whatever they are seeded with. If you put something in a network, the network functions like a social magnifying glass. But the network is agnostic. It will magnify Ebola and violence and fake news and fascism and hatred, but it will also, and germs. But it will also magnify love and kindness and ideas and, uh, and altruism. But it must be seeded. Some external force must impinge on the graph to get the epidemic uh, going. Now, of course, there's a lot more going on here than just social contagion. Uh, so for instance, in, in work on the contagion of obesity or academic performance or crime, uh, several things could be happening. One idea is the kind of social contagion or a social domino effect or induction. The idea that is, if I gain weight, it makes Ali gain weight, and then it spreads onwards to Yad and so forth. Another possibility is that it's not that my weight gain causes Ali's weight gain. Rather, he and I form a relationship, uh, birds of a feather flock together, or homophily, love of like, because we share a similar body size or similar interest in food or something to begin with. And a third possibility is that it's neither, 
don't know if we can orient the camera a little bit. It's, it's being trimmed off here. But it's neither, it's neither the foregoing, but it's some contextual factor, uh, like a gym that's making us both uh, lose weight or uh, a fast food joint that's making us uh, both gain weight. And all three are typically present in any social phenomena. Uh, and it takes effort using diverse econometric and experimental techniques to tease these apart. And we have been contributing to the literature on, on the econometrics of this over the last 10 or 15 years. Now, at some point, we began to do experiments. And this was our first experiment that was published about seven years ago. And this experiment was prompted not only by our interest in more robust causal inference, but also by our interest in getting a deeper understanding of the purpose of human social networks. In this experiment, uh, college students who were strangers to each other were brought into the laboratory and were randomly assigned into groups of four. And they were told to play a public goods game. So this group of us would be together. If I contribute one of my dollars to the group, the investigators would double it. And that money would be divided amongst the foursome. So everyone would get 50 cents. The group would benefit by $2, but I would lose 50 cents. So from a purely rational point of view, the thing I want to do is to defect, not contribute, hope that everyone else contributes. Uh, and then I will get a reward, but without contributing. Of course, if everyone does that, the commons collapses. And conversely, the best outcome is if everyone contributes maximally, then everyone's uh, contributions are doubled. Now, in this experiment, what we were interested in is not if I am nice to Ali, it, does he reciprocate the kindness to me, a kind, of, uh, a kind of reciprocal altruism, which itself is a deep and interesting question. Nor were we interested in the indirect reciprocity. So if I'm kind to Ali, is Dean kind to me, which is also an old and interesting and deep topic. What we were interested in is if I'm kind to Ali, does he then go on to be kind to you? Can we find evidence of a kind of spreading process in the network? So in this experiment, what would happen is a bell would ring periodically, and people would be assigned to new groups. And what we were able to show is just that, that if Eleni is kind to Lucas in period one, Lucas is kind to Erica in period two, Erica is kind to Jay in period three, and Jay is kind to Brecken in period four. Now, this is one of the more bizarre results to come out of my lab as well in the last few years. Because what I've just told you is that how Jay treats Brecken depends on how Eleni treated Lucas, even though neither Jay nor Brecken ever interacted with Eleni or Lucas. So how you two people treat each other depends on how you two people treat each other, even though you don't know who they are. So there's a kind of spreading process in the network. This can only be due to social contagion. It's not due to homophily or context in this situation. And this geodesic spread through the network spread of kindness is distinct from the temporal persistence, such that if Eleni is kind to Lucas in period one, he learns to be kind, and is kind to Erica in period two, and Lysander in period three, and Bemi in period four, and Sebastian in period five, and so forth. In fact, if you fold back through the network, for every extra dollar that Eleni gives Lucas, the network functions as a kind of matching grant, doubling the downstream benefit. So pay it forward is real. And this is one of our first experiments to look at uh, uh, demonstrate social contagion uh, within graphs. Now, to be clear, we are affected in another way by social networks. It's not just what's happening around us that matters. The actual structure of the network also matters. So think about these two objects. As you all know, they are allotropes of carbon. And on the left, you have graphite, which is soft and dark. And on the right, you have diamond, which is hard and clear. And there are two key intellectual ideas here. First, these properties of softness and darkness and hardness and clearness are not properties of the carbon atoms. They're properties of the collection of carbon atoms. And second, which properties you get depends on how you connect the carbon atoms to each other. Connect them one way, you get one set of properties. Connect the same carbon atoms another way, you get a different set of properties. And it's the same with human groups. You can take a group of people and connect them one way, and they have one set of properties. They're healthy and innovative and wealthy and cooperative. Or you take the same people and connect them another way, and they have none of those uh, properties, in fact. It's the ties between people that make the whole greater than the sum of its parts. New properties, such as cooperation and violence, health and happiness, and uh, innovativeness and productivity, can emerge because of the connections because of the ties between people, and not necessarily because of the people themselves. So it's not just what's happening around us that matters, whether people are gaining or losing weight or being altruistic or not. The actual structure of the graph also matters to the experience of the individuals within it and to the experience of the group as a whole. And in fact, our experience of the world also depends on the actual structure of the ties around us near and far. 
Okay, now that's like 17 minutes on, with a selection of 10 years of work. And about, about five years ago, uh, in, in my group, and I'm closely affiliated with James Fowler's group at UC San Diego, we began to ask what we call our so what question. So what if we can understand the structure and function of human social networks? What can we do with that knowledge to make the world better? How can we intervene in social systems and conduct experiments at the same time that give us a deeper understanding of how these things work and more strong, stronger tools to actually intervene in the world? And these sorts of observations that we've been making that I briefly introduced you to suggest three broad ways to intervene in networks to enhance public health and public policy and to use social networks for good. So one class of interventions manipulates connection or changes the structure of the network. This class of intervention is interested in the wiring rules. How is the network wired? What rules dictate who is connected to who or who is disconnected from who? A second set of interventions manipulates contagion or changes the flows. It says, given a fixed topology, given a graph, to whom should we target the intervention to maximize flows across the system? A kind of network control idea in some ways. And a third possibility is position or to change the location. And this is some of the newest work we've been doing and also linking it with some of our work on artificial intelligence, which I'll come to at the end. Here the idea is, is that we have a graph that's the structure of which is defined. We have an ensemble of human beings who are going to be put into this graph. Where should those people be placed in the graph to maximize social welfare? Given that we have these people here, this guy should go here, and this person should go there. Is there a way to thoughtfully arrange them in the graph to get optimal outcomes from the collective point of view? Now, to do some of this work, we've been supported by some of our efforts to develop software for this. Uh, we have developed and released into the public domain a, a suite of software called Breadboard, again, modeled on my, all of you guys know this, probably all of you made circuits in high school where you, you know, took the battery and the wires and the light bulb and the resistors and the capacitors. You made a little circuit and you flip the switch and the light bulb goes on. You, this was done, well, in my generation, this was done on something called a breadboard where it would stick into a little pegboard. Now they probably do it on computers. But anyway, you would physically take the components and stick them into a little thing called a breadboard. So our fantasy was to create a kind of social science equivalent of engineering breadboards where you can take interlocking components and drop them down and assemble an experiment. So in this experiment, we can create temporary artificial societies of real people because this software is integrated with crowdsourcing platforms like Amazon Mechanical Turk. So it posts hits, recruits thousands of people that are flow into this online laboratory and then are dropped into these virtual societies where we can control the topology and the payoff matrix and, and, and the information asymmetry and the, all kinds of aspects of these uh, social systems. And we've done a lot of experiments, some of which I'm gonna present to you today. This is one of our first experiments, which followed closely on the back of the other one. In this experiment, this is, uh, manipulates connection to affect how cooperative a group of, of people are. And this experiment explores how the rules of interaction in a social system could affect the ability, its ability, to produce a desirable property, namely cooperation among its members. So in this experiment, a few thousand, a couple thousand, I can't remember, people were uh, brought into this online laboratory, and they were dropped into different versions of networks, structures. So, um, so here, they could be dropped into a fixed graph. This is an Urgis Renyi random graph with 30% tie saturation. So it looks like this. Uh, the people are dropped into the network. They're introduced to their neighbors. And once again, they are told to play a public goods game with their neighbors. The red dots are the defectors, and the blue dots are the nice cooperators that cooperate with their neighbors. And at the beginning, about 65% of the people are blue dots, play the cooperative strategy with their neighbor. And here in this branch of the experiment where they are dropped into a fixed lattice or a fixed network that doesn't change across time, we find that across time over the rounds of the game, by the end, all the red dots have taken over. The world is full of defectors. There's just this little group of cooperators here sticking together on the edge of the network trying to keep civilization alive. Uh, but everyone else has become a defector. Why? Well, because if I drop you into a network and you're stuck with these people, and all you can do is you cooperate, but they defect, after a while you say to hell with that, and you switch to defection too. And in that type of a regime, defection uh, takes over the system. In a different branch of the experiment, we randomly assign people into a topological frame in which in addition to choosing whether to defect or cooperate at each round, they could also choose whether to cut the ties to people around them or to 
keep the ties uh, to people around them. And they, we manipulated the fluidity of that process. For instance, in this experiment here, they could cut the ties 30% of the time. The ties were up for renewal. And in this branch of the experiment, we find that cooperation persists. So the sort of the intellectual point here is, is that I can take you guys and I can connect you one way, guided by theory, and you are sort of really sweet and nice to each other. Or I could take you same people and connect you a different way, and you're mean sons of bitches to each other. So same people connected different ways gives rise to different properties. In a subsequent paper uh, that was published in Nature Communications, done with one of my graduate students, Hiro Shirato, we uh, swept the parameter space of the rewiring rate. This is the social fluidity. This is how sticky the ties are. Are they permanent? Are they instantaneously changeable or something in between? On the x-axis is the rewiring rate. 0% rewiring means rigid network, just like the first example I showed you before. 100% rewiring means that at every moment, every tie is up for renewal at every round and everything in between. And on the y-axis is, is a regression-based estimate of the cooperativity of the individuals. And what we find, as predicted by theory, is a kind of parabolic shape. So that at low levels of rewiring, you get low levels of cooperation. And at very high levels of rewiring, you also get low levels of cooperation. And the optimal cooperation is in the middle regime of social fluidity. Why is that? Well, I already told you why it's here. Here, you're stuck with these people, and they take advantage of you, so you switch to defection. Here, you have a different kind of thing happening. Why should you invest in your neighbors if they're going to be gone in the next moment? If every tie is up for rewiring every single round, there's no reason to invest in your neighbors. So you want something in the middle regime. And we actually think that this illustrates a deep reason for many social institutions in our society. Think about marriage. You don't want divorce to be impossible, because if divorce is impossible, if one person is a mean, then the other person just becomes mean too. But you also don't want marriage, you don't want divorce to be instantaneously easy so that you can just say, well, I'm done with you and just leave. I'm going to get a new spouse every moment. Because then you also don't invest in your spouse. You want, it, you want a regime that, of institutions that makes divorce difficult to leave but not impossible to leave so that people invest in each other. Or think about the home mortgage deduction, another institution in our society. If you put people in a neighborhood that they can never leave, and the people around them are acting like criminals, they also start acting like criminals. Your neighbors neglect the commons. You don't take care of the, your garden in front of your house either. Conversely, at the other extreme, if your neighbor changes every day, you also don't bother to take care of the property in front of you. You want a regime that creates intermediate levels of social uh, fluidity. We've performed a number of experiments. I just showed you one that manipulate the topological regimes, the kind of rules of connection uh, that I just showed you. Now let me show you a couple of experiments that we've done manipulating um, contagion. This is a paradigm of experiments that we've done in developing world settings. So we work around the world. We've worked in Honduras, in India, in Uganda, in uh, Tanzania, in Sudan. We've sort of mapped networks, different parts of the world. And we've done experiments in many of those parts of the world as well. Uh, imagine you have two different villages, but, but equally this could apply to two different classrooms or two different workplaces or, or, uh, or two different hospitals or any kind of two different venues. And you map the networks of these two venues and you have just enough money to reach these six people in the network that are highlighted in yellow, chosen here at random. Now the ordinary public health perspective is as you go into the field, you deliver the public health intervention to those six people and you come back a year later and you measure what fraction of those six people responded. Maybe three of the six adopted the public health practice that you were encouraging them to do. But that's, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in response to treatment among the treated. Remember, I'm interested in response to treatment among the untreated. I want to know what does everyone else in the village do when you target those uh, six individuals. So maybe in this example, three of the six targeted people respond, and maybe they affect three of their neighbors to respond, a total of six people perhaps in this village. And in the control village that didn't get the intervention, perhaps, let's say, uh, two of the people respond just by secular change, adopt the practice. So that difference between six and two is a measure of the spillover effect, the pure spillover effect in this situation. But as you're all probably already intuiting, we don't need to pick six people at random. Maybe we can pick six people according to a variety of mathematical algorithms that would maximize the structural influence. Maybe there are thoughtful ways we can pick people within the graph such that if we target them, we get a bigger impact 
For instance, trivially, maybe we pick the six most central people in the network. Here, once again, perhaps three of the six people respond, but maybe they recruit 30 of their friends. Same village, same intervention, same number of people targeted, 10 times the effect, because we have shrewdly and thoughtfully selected structurally influential individuals guided by a variety of ideas from network science about who such individuals might be. Now, um, it turns out that if you really want to do this in public health settings, you want to be able to identify structurally influential people without the cost and time and headaches of, uh, of mapping the networks, because this is not always possible. So, we, be, we were wondering whether we could identify structurally influential individuals without having to map network ties for a whole population. For instance, k-means clustering would be a wonderful way to identify structurally influential people, but you, to do that, you have to do all this complex rigmarole, map the network, do the mathematics, find the people, go back. So is there a simpler way of doing that? Well, it turns out that there's a mathematical fact about social networks known as the friendship paradox that's summarized by the statement that your friends have more friends than you do. Did you know this? Your friends have more friends than you do. Your sexual partners have more sexual partners than you do too, by the way. And what really annoys me is that your co-authors have more co-authors than you do. Um, so this is a general uh, uh, mathematical property of graphs. Uh, if, you, if you map a graph, the average of the degree distribution, the average person has mu friends, and the average friend of an average person has mu plus the variance in the degree distribution divided by mu friends. So in expectation, your friends have more friends than you do. Now, I can cultivate that intuition in a number of ways. One of the easiest ways is just to ask you to consider the boundary conditions. So imagine that you pick these people on the edge of the graph. If this person is asked who his friend is, he must nominate this person. That's why he's on the edge. He only has one friend. And his friend, by necessity, has to have more friends than he does, at least two friends. And sometimes many more. So this person will nominate this person who has, let's say, eight friends. So you should have the intuition that at least for everyone on the edge of the network, their friends should have more friends than they do. And it turns out this holds throughout the whole network. So if you pick people at random, like the six yellow dots, and, and then pick one of their friends at random, and then you treat, like as shown here, the orange dots, those dots will have higher degree and be more central in the network. And the reason this is useful is that you can identify the orange dots without having to map the network. You can now identify structurally influential people, go into a village, pick people at random, ask them to nominate their friends, and then deliver the vaccine or the treatment um, to their friends. So we've been testing this idea in a number of experiments. This is a quick snapshot of where we work in the highland villages uh, of Honduras. This is a very uh, uh, poor part of the world. Uh, where um, people here live on about $2 a day, and these are very small villages. They're about 100 to 1,000 people. Uh, I was giving a talk about this work a couple of years ago in China, and I, I said, you know, these are very small villages, and they said, oh, we'd like to take you to one of our small villages, and I said, that'd be great. And I went to the small village, and there were 500,000 people uh, in that small village uh, in, in China. These are truly small villages. There are 100 to about 1,000 people in, in these villages. It's a very hilly part of the world. It's a kind of coffee-growing uh, region. And here we had to develop some other software that would allow us to efficiently map these networks. This is our so-called Trellis software, which we've also made publicly available. It's battle-hardened. It fits on a tablets. It can go into developing world settings. Um, and, and we developed this software to solve what we call our Maria Hernandez problem. So in, in, this is a low literacy population, and it has other features which give us this problem. So if you go into these villages and you ask a woman, for instance, who's your friend, many of them will say Maria Hernandez. Well, which Maria Hernandez? There are quite a few Maria Hernandezes. So you need to have a way of uniquely identifying each Maria Hernandez. So this software will allow you to do a photographic census of the network. As the person says Maria Hernandez, it brings up the Maria H's Hernandez's. You point to the one, oh, that one. You hit the button, click, it makes the link, and you proceed with the survey and then can collect additional um, information. So on our first project here, uh, published in 2015, uh, we, um, which was sort of the beginning of a set of projects like this by a number of labs around the country, um, we mapped the networks of 32 villages, and then we randomly assigned the villages in the following way. In this third of the villages, 5% of the people were chosen at random to get the intervention. At this third of the villages, 5% of the people were chosen according to who had the most connections. And in this third of the villages, 5% of the people were chosen using the friendship nomination uh, technique. Then they all got the same intervention. 
Here it was a public, uh, it was a clean water and, uh, and a multivitamin intervention. And this slide illustrates how the targeting might look different uh, according to the targeting algorithm in a very intuitive and obvious way. So here's one of the villages. Here is what the 5% uh, of the villages chosen at random are shown in orange, and 5% of the villagers cho chosen according to who had the highest degree are shown in yellow. And unsurprisingly, you can see that there's a difference between those uh, two groups in who is chosen, structurally a difference. And here's a slide of some of our most basic results from this paper published in The Lancet. On the y-axis, on the x-axis is the days since initial targeting. On the x-axis is the proportion of the people adopting the multivitamin intervention. And what we find very briefly is that the nomination targeting algorithm works the best. You get the fastest and most complete adoption of the multivitamin intervention when you use the nomination targeting algorithm um, compared to the others. Question. Yeah. Do you ask them to name a friend, or do you ask no. them to name who they think is the most central among them? No, what we do in this situation is, we, in this, because it's research purposes, we, we did map the whole networks. Once we map them, we pick the people at random, and then we picked at random one of their friends. Now, of course, in field conditions, it could differ if you ask the person to nominate their friend instead of mapping it. And it could differ in ways that are even better. So you ask, think of all your friends. Tell me who among your friends is the most popular, and then deliver it to that person. And you could mathematically, I would love to do this project if there's someone interested, you could model out what would, how much extra improvement would you get if you pick the most popular friend of each person's friends at random. We've not done that project. Or you could imagine going two degrees through the network without backstepping. So you go friend of a friend. That we have looked at. And friend of a friend uh, targeting doesn't gain you very much compared to, you, I'll show you in a moment. It gains you some, friend of, friend gains you some, friend of a friend gains you a little more, but not enough. Did I answer your question? Other questions? Yeah. Uh, how, how would you explain, uh, I guess intuitively, uh, random being better than uh, individual? Yes, I have a really good explanation for that. Uh, and so. What's happening, we think, with the in-degree is that um, uh, there's a high, there's degree of sortativity in networks, so popular people befriend popular people. So when you sample on in-degree, you get tight, compact clusters of targets that are within near each other. So you don't get as much benefit of spreading them out. In fact, one of the other advantages of the friendship nomination technique is it's kind of like a carpet bombing trick. And it sort of spreads out the targets all over the graph. And another way of getting an intuition about this is imagine that the graph has two components. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the largest connected component, which let's say has 80% of the dots of the nodes, and maybe a secondary component, which has, let's say, 15%. And imagine, which is likely, that all the most connected people are in the big graph. If you picked your targets just from the most connected, the people with the highest degree, you would have no, no seeding at all to the second component. So you immediately for, preclude the possibility of even reaching that graph. So that's why, in the limit, we think that this is what's happening here, why, in fact, random targeting is outperforming in-degree targeting here. We, we've, we've modeled out some other ideas, but we really focus now on this nomination targeting trick because we want our tools, I was talking to some people earlier, we, wanna, we want our tools to be used by others. So we want to invent stuff that actually will be taken into the field. And if you required mapping of the network every time, it, nobody would use it. Now, we, with big data techniques, increasingly people in developing countries you can use phone data to map their networks. I mean, there are other ways to do it, but anyway. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yes? Some graphs are more time independent than others are more time dependent. Like the Lucas graph, uh, it seems to be time dependent. So have you looked at extinction and persistence of uh, helpful behavior to the neighbor? Yeah, that's a really good question. We have looked at issues of extinction and persistence generally with educational interventions. So as you know, uh, alas, most educational interventions eventually extinguish, we are trying to uh, model. We did one project, a modeling exercise. It wasn't an experiment where we looked at latrine adoption in India to look at what was it that was associated with permanent change in latrine behavior in India, not just transient change when the latrines were introduced, for instance, just initial adoption and then decay versus a sustained uh, change across time. That with data, I'm about to tell you a project, we're going to have the temporal resolution to more carefully address the question that I think you're asking, which is, is there something structural associated with the duration of the effect? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, you need a special kind of data for that, which uh, we haven't had experimentally yet. We could analyze some of our data, which I'm not presenting you, looking at some of our cooperation experiments. Uh, we go back and do the experiment a week later with Lucas and his friends. 
uh, with Lucas. Who, who do you mean by Lucas? Who was one of the protagonists. Oh, Lucas and his friends. Oh, I see it earlier. Um, you mean for learning effects? Does Lucas, oh, uh, you mean? The, the, uh, the beneficent effect. So does Lucas, uh, so Lucas. Nice to the person after him and the person after him. You mean, oh, I see, but, but without us reseeding the network, you mean we just bring Lucas back and say, okay, now play the game again. Would Lucas act the same way the second time? Something like that. Yeah. So, uh, so David Rand, who is moving to MIT soon, uh, has done some experiments on, I think, exactly that topic, looking at sort of cooperative phenotypes in individuals, looking at people who played many games across time to see whether, in fact, they behave consistently. And the answer to that is yes. And also habit formation. Yes, as well. You learn. Yeah. OK, this new experiment that we are in the field with now in Honduras, I think is the largest, or certainly one of the largest, uh, uh, mappings of face-to-face -face networks ever undertaken. We are using now, we've moved to the Copan region of Honduras in western Honduras, a different part of Honduras, 30,000 people in 176 villages. We have mapped the networks of all of these people in all of these villages. And we're randomly assigning the villages to different uh, treatments. So this experiment is designed as follows. Uh, we have an 8 by 2 factorial design. We are varying the percentage of people in the villages given the intervention. This is a two-year maternal and child health intervention. So it's a sustained intervention that has many components about uh, maternal and child health, uh, umbilical cord care, uh, paternal involvement in delivery, uh, breastfeeding, a folic acid, antidiarrheal treatments, or a whole bunch of parts of this package. That's standard. Everyone gets that for two years. Uh, but we vary the fraction of people in the villages that get it. And we have two different targeting methods, random or nomination. 8 times 2 is 16. There are 11 villages in each of these cells. And we are now going to measure, I think for the first time, by empirically generating an S-shaped diffusion of innovation curves. So many people have, of course, generated such curves before. Many people have tracked, including Sinan, I don't know if he's here, have tracked the flow of such things, uh, who's at MIT, but I don't know if he's here in this room, have done this stuff before. But what we're doing is, is we're actually experimentally varying the x-axis. We're experimentally manipulating the targeting fraction, and then we're looking at the percent reached at the end of the experiment. So for instance, um, imagine here that there's 0 to 100% of the people targeted, and 0 to 50% of the people respond. You target 100% of the people, 50% respond. Or 40% of the people, 20% of the people respond. Uh, if there's no social effect, you get a linear response. So you have to target more and more people to get more and more to respond to your intervention, up to a ceiling, which is the maximum that can respond for whatever uh, reason. Not everyone is going to adopt your intervention. Now, as you all know, of course, classic response is an S-shaped diffusion of innovation curve or an epidemic growth curve. And here, this reflects a social effect. So as low levels of adoption, the non-adoption of the people around you suppresses your probability of adoption. So you have very little early adoption, except the sort of early adopters. And then you get an inflection point. You get the explosive growth phase of the epidemic. And then you get a plateau. Now the social effect works with you. So the adoption by your friends increases your response to the treatment. And then it plateaus, of course, when you saturate, when you reach all the people that might adopt. Well, what we want to show or measure is can we shift this curve to the left? Can we enhance the social effect by shrewd targeting of the nodes in the network? And in fact, what this might show, our fantasy is, sort of we drew this picture on a whiteboard about three years ago, and now I'm now going to come back in another three years and see if we were right. It takes like six years from conception to data. Uh, we're going to see whether, in fact, we can shift the curve to the left such that, for instance, you might target 20% of the people chosen correctly, and it might give you 100% of the response. So that's another two experiments, one completed, one underway, that illustrate contagion. Let me show you one experiment that illustrates position, and then I'll close with one big idea, and we'll have some more time uh, for questions. This is our, a very recent experiment, which was just published in Nature like a few months ago, manipulating the position and exploiting some other ideas involving artificial um, intelligence. Here we are exploring the performance of groups engaged in collective coordination tasks and not just cooperation. And here the paradigm is a so-called color coordination task uh, sort of propounded by Michael Kearns, a computer scientist at UPenn, where people must pick a color dissimilar from their neighbors and the whole group is incentivized to converge on a solution. 
So you create a graph. These graphs are created by preferential attachment. Um, you drop people into the network. You give them a color at random. And you tell them, you, each of you has to pick a color dissimilar than your neighbors. If and only if you all pick a color dissimilar from your neighbors, the group gets paid. So you have to work together. So you, all of you have picked a color dissimilar from your neighbors. And then that will count as success and will pay you uh, for that effort. So, um, so here they are. And the red lines show the, the uh, color co uh, the conflicts. So this guy is an orange guy. This guy is an orange guy. They can see that they're in conflict. This guy has a yellow connection. If he switches to purple, he will resolve that tension and help optimize locally, uh, you know, minimize the conflicts in his local region. Now, the objective function can be characterized by the number of color conflicts. So uh, this is the count of how many conflicts there are 12 you know, red lines here, right here uh, in this uh, graph. Uh, but there are two kinds of color conflicts, sort of resolvable conflicts and unresolvable conflict. A resolvable conflict is, for example, this conflict. This guy can switch colors to purple and resolve the problem. He has a choice he can make, which if he makes, resolves the conflict he's in. But some people are in unresolvable conflicts. Like this guy here, for example, or I can't see. There's some guy here. This guy here, he can't switch from orange to purple or yellow. He's in conflict with the two oranges, because that would put him into conflict with someone else, for example. So there are 11 unresolvable conflicts and one uh, uh, 11 resolvable conflicts and one unresolvable one here. Anyway, the game starts playing. People move through time. This game lasts about five minutes. This is in seconds. And here we reach at the 105 second mark. Only one conflict exists in this network. Unfortunately, it's an unresolvable conflict. Neither of these two guys is able to pick a color dissimilar from his neighbor. So one of them has to do something that increases conflict temporarily, maybe. And that's, in fact, what happens. And then by the end of the graph, they reach a, a different solution. So everyone is, most of the people have changed colors, and they, um, they solve uh, the game. So these, these numbers, you, probably most of you know, or maybe some of you know, there's something known as a chromatic number of a graph. It's the, number, the minimum number of colors needed to color the graph in this fashion. Of course, if you gave these people more colors, like four or five or six colors to choose from, the problem would be easier. We only give them the minimum number, the, the chromatic number of colors in this situation. And all our graphs are three colorable in this experiment. So what we did in this situation, however, is we, we checked how good the human beings were at solving this problem. And we found that the human beings could solve the problem within five minutes, let's say 65% of the time. And then, because we're sneaky, we replaced three of the people with bots. So we took out the humans and we replaced them with bots. And we programmed these bots with what we call dumb artificial intelligence. Now, my lab is not a computer science lab. So I'm not able to invent AlphaGo or IBM Watson or machine learning algorithms. Probably a third of you can do super duper things with machine algorithms, machine learning algorithms. I cannot do that. But I'm not interested in inventing super smart AI to replace human cognition. I'm interested in inventing dumb AI to supplement human interaction. I'm interested in creating hybrid systems of humans and machines. And the machines can afford to be very stupid because they're mixed in with smart humans. And all the machines are trying to do is to help the humans help themselves. They're trying to get the humans to overcome the activation energy, act like a catalyst to get the humans to solve a collective action problem in different kinds of ways. So what we did in this situation is, is our, our initial approach here was just to add some noise. So we programmed the bots to pick the minimum color, so at every time step, these, the, the, this is a continuous time game. So the humans are changing colors constantly. On average, every second or two, the humans change their colors. When we first did some pilot work here, we had the bots change their colors instantaneously. That drove the humans crazy. So we had to slow the bots down so that they were changing their colors once every one and a half second. Every one and a half second, the bot looks at his environment or her environment and says, I'm going to pick a color that's in minimum conflict with my neighbors and chooses that color. That's 0% noise. Or the bot does that, but 10% of the time picks a color that increases, picks a random color that maybe increases the conflict. Or 30% of the time has 30% noise. And we furthermore randomly varied whether the bots were placed randomly within the network, in the center of the network, or in the peripheral network. We had over 4,000 people participate in this game. We created 230 independent groups of unique players. And what I'm showing you here is the performance at the group level. The yellow lines show the performance of the 30 groups of people who only had human beings. That's the control version. On the x-axis is time. 
On the y-axis is the probability these are survival curves, the probability that the group has not solved the coordination game. So at the beginning, no, no group has solved the game. And by the end, as I said earlier, 65% of the people have of the groups have solved the game. And as you can see here, when we give bots with 10% noise in the center of the network, we can significantly enhance the performance of these teams of people. Bots that had more or less noise were not helpful. Bots placed in other uh, topological areas and other positions uh, were not helpful either. Furthermore, we were able to find something else. So there's something in addition to the chromatic number. There's an independent or, or related idea known as the chromatic polynomial. That's the number of solutions of a number of different ways you can color the graph. So even though these graphs look very similar to us, this graph might have six different ways you can three color it. And this very similar looking graph might have 12,000 ways you could three color it. We found that the bots were especially helpful when the problem was hard. When there were few solutions, that's when the bots especially helped. So here, uh, uh, this shows the bots placed in the peripheral or the central location. This is what happens when the solution set is moderately large. So there are about 400 different ways you can color this graph with three colors. And here you can see this network with many solutions. It doesn't matter whether you place the bots peripherally or centrally. The humans are able to work the problem and find a solution. But in a regime in which the solution set is small, there are only 24 solutions, the humans are only able to solve the problem if you put the bots in the central location, the noisy bots, the 10% noisy bots in the central location. Putting them in the peripheral location doesn't help either. What's the reason it's working? Well, what's happening is, is it's like simulated annealing or like, um, or like, uh, like uh, a variety of other, like search with error, like a, a variety of phenomena where a little bit of error helps reach a global optimum. So the metaphor that I use is the following, if I've understood what you're asking. So far, does it look like I understood what you're asking? OK. So the metaphor I use is, is imagine you have a landscape with hills and a mountain. And you drop four people uh, at random at some spot on this landscape. And you handcuff them together. And they're each looking in a cardinal direction. And you blindfold them. And you tell them, climb to the highest mountain. So they talk among themselves. And they agree they're each going to take a step in their direction. And uh, North reports it's uphill from in my direction. East and West say it's lateral. South say it's downhill. So they all agree to go north one step. And they go north one step, and then they repeat the same procedure. And they keep repeating this procedure until they zigzag up to the top, where they all report back it's downhill from here. Well, have they reached the highest mountain? No. They've just reached the nearest hilltop. The high mountain is over there. But they'll never get there now, because they're stuck on the top of this mountain. They cannot tolerate going downhill. But if you add a little error, if, let's say, every 10% 10, 10 of the time you permit them to take a downhill step, what will happen is this group will now suddenly, you know, occasionally in chance, get to the valley. And when they get to the valley, they might climb another hill. And eventually, they'll explore the whole fitness landscape, and they'll get to the highest mountain. And when they get to the highest mountain, they're more likely to stay there. Because there, to go all the way down to the nearest valley, you have to go way down. So they might go partially down, turn around, and come back up. So they might oscillate on top of the highest mountaintop in that situation. So adding a little noise, permitting a little error, is better. Another metaphor that I use, and this is more suitable for people my age, is when I was at your undergraduate or graduate student age, when you, when you wanted to go to the library to find a book, you went to the card catalog file, and you wanted to find a biography of Winston Churchill, and you went up to the stacks, and you said, oh, here's the book I was looking for. And then two books over, you say, oh, this is a better book. I'll take this book instead. And so a little error optimizes search, but not too much. You don't want to be on a different floor of the library and find biochemistry textbooks instead of Churchill biographies. So a little search with error can enhance the outcome. So that's the core reason here. Now, here we're just using noisy bots, but we have many other ideas of dumb AI that uh, can help us. I'm going to skip. Uh, I, we, this slide shows. I'm not going to walk you through it. It, it just shows that. Um, that uh, what's happening here is the bots aren't just simplifying the task of the humans to whom they are connected. The bots are actually changing the behavior of the whole system. They are helping the humans to help themselves. So when I have some noisy bots in the system, even people who are not connected to the bots get a little bit noisier and get better at solving the problem among themselves. In our newest work, and then I'll close with one big idea, we're exploring different kinds of social dilemmas or collective action problems. 
involving cooperation, coordination, evacuation, navigation, and sharing. How can we get people to share better? How should we program driverless cars when we are in a hybrid system of humans and machines on the road? You know, if we're in one extreme, just humans, or another extreme, just robotic cars, we might know what to do. But when we have a mixed system, how should the cars be programmed to optimize flow of traffic, minimize accidents, et cetera? Uh, and so we have a number of games that we're inventing and a number of programming of the bots that we are um, exploring. Um, so, and then finally, we hope, and I was talking to someone today, I can't remember right now, we hope to do some experiments where we begin to release these bots into the wild, working with partners. For instance, we have some ideas about bots that reduce racism online uh, and bots that enhance uh, the, the ability of online groups to work, um, uh, work together. Okay, let me close with one final idea having to do with what it means when we intervene in a social network. Because I think such network, such interventions provide us with a way to manipulate social capital. Now to get a sense of this, consider this idea. What's the point of a connected life? How does it help us as individuals and as a species? Well, it turns out that networks are a resource that we can all use. Networks are, in fact, a kind of social capital. And most people, when they think about capital, think about money. But really, capital is any stock of resources that can be put to productive use. So capital is a stock that you can produce something with. And two further key ideas about capital are that in order to create capital, you have to invest skill and effort. You have to know something and do something to create capital. And second, and more subtle, and an idea that's been keeping me awake for like 10 years, I've been thinking about this, are that in order to create capital, you have to make changes in a substance that make it yield a higher rate of return than it otherwise would. That at its core, the capital creation process is about a transmogrification of the natural world. What do I mean by that? Well, take this example. You have this forest. You invest skill and effort, and you transform it into a farm. And the farm is more valuable than the forest because you can do things with a farm you couldn't do with a forest, namely produce fruits and vegetables and grains, for example. So you invest skill and effort, you transform the land, and now it becomes a stock, a reservoir of wealth, and a source of productive power. Or consider this idea. You take this tree, you invest skill and effort, and you mill it into lumber. And the lumber is more valuable than the tree because you can do things with the lumber you couldn't do with a tree, namely invest still more skill and effort and make a violin. And the violin is more valuable than the lumber because you can do things with the violin you couldn't do with the lumber, namely make music. So at every step of the way, you invest skill and effort, you transform the natural world, you imbue or endow the thing you've created with a productive power, which is what makes it a reservoir of wealth. Well, in the 1960s, social scientists began to think about human beings this way in a kind of human capital. So you can take this dissolute former graduate student of mine who's a drunkard, and you invest skill and effort. You send him to Alcoholics Anonymous, and you clean him up. And now he's more capable of doing things he was not previously able to do. Or you can invest still more skill and effort and give him an education. And now he's even more capable of doing things he was not able to do. At each step of the way, you invest skill and effort, and you work on the neurons of his mind. You transform his brain and make it capable of doing things it was not previously able to do. Well. Just like physical capital is created by a change in the material world, and human capital by a change in persons, social capital in organizations, in companies, in communities, in fact, in our whole society, is a change in the relations among persons, a change that renders the group more productive and capable of doing things it was not previously able to do. It gives rise to emergent properties in social systems. And that's the deepest account I can give you of what social networks mean for our lives and why it is that we can use them to make our world better. Thank you very much. When you say one, it creates a budget constraint that uh, <laughs> no one wants to be the one. Yes. And the yellow and orange dots, if they're both close to the center, you can reverse the arrow. If you do not, 
Say that again? When you say uh, your friends have more friends than you have. Yes. If you're both close to the center of the network you, and you reverse the arrow between the yellow and orange, it seems Well, if you're both, in, it's when you get to the center of the network, then it's, remember, it's an in, in expectation, the average node, the average friend of the average node. Of course, there are many people for whom, uh, the, for instance, the most popular person in the network, that person, all of their friends will have less friends than they do. That's right. But that's the only person for whom that'll hold. So for everyone else, on average, on average, across people and across friends, it holds the friendship paradox. Okay. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. <laughs>